So we are most grateful that Dr. Wilcox is uh, presenting today. Uh, she was a school psychologist for eight years before completing her uh, D in school psychology in 2009. She completed postdoctoral training in clinical neuropsychology, where she practiced as a licensed psychologist until joining the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. Dr. Wilcox is a registered psychologist in Alberta and a nationally certified school psychologist. Thank you, Dr. Wilcox. I, I hand it to you. Great, thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, first I wanted to start off by thanking Julian for all of the hard behind the scenes work that he does to get all of these um, webinars up and running and available to everybody. Thank you. All right, so first of all, as well, I would like to encourage you, if you have the opportunity to take the official CBIT training, um, so it's a, usually a weekend, and then afterwards, you get supervised training in implementing CBIT by um, phone calls as you go through the process, so it's really valuable if you um, do regular work with individuals with Tourette syndrome. Either way, I suggest that you purchase these two books. So Managing Tourette Syndrome is the therapist guide, um, and it walks you through a lot of the information that you need. And the Managing Tourette Syndrome is the workbook that the child or uh, adult would use throughout this process, and they're both very valuable in supporting the implementation of CBIT. So today we'll talk about the rationale for CBIT, identify what kind of clients it's good for, We'll go over the evidence base for its effectiveness. We'll review the treatment structure. We'll talk about uh, tick symptom tracking and how to select the right ticks to target, functional behavior assessments, and functional based interventions. So the rationale for CBIT about why we focus on it this way is that we do know that external environmental cues can increase ticks. So anything new and stimulating, even really wonderful things like going on a vacation can increase ticks for individuals. Additionally, internal states like anxiety or excitement, again, about that vacation can also increase ticks. We can't control the neurology that causes uh, Tourette syndrome or tics, but we can teach people to control their internal states and their external environments. And so that's one of the rationales for why we use CBIT to help people with tics. There are two primary components of CBIT. The first is behavior therapy or functional behavior interventions, and the second is habit reversal. So functional behavioral interventions focus on the things that make ticks worse, and we work to modify those things to either reduce the ticks themselves or to reduce the impairment of those ticks. And then habit reversal is a process where we give individuals more control over their ticks by teaching them a competing response. So again, you can see in both of these that the key word is manage. So we're not making them go away, um, but we're helping to give our clients more control over their lives. Again, CBIT is not a cure. Um, it, after you go through this program, Tourette's doesn't go away, but it does offer, again, tools for people to manage and take more control over their lives and their ticks. So we do know that it's really important that we use evidence-based practice support to support our clients because we really want to make sure that um, we're doing things that work. We're not wasting their time or their money. So there are lots of different ways that we determine um, what evidence-based is. And one of the primary ways is by what um, major organizations say as they've looked at the research on it. So comprehensive behavior intervention for ticks meets the American Psychological Association criteria for a well-established intervention. And CBA is also the first-line treatment in Europe, Canada, and the United States. A study that was published this year looking at the long-term outcomes of CBIT had some really positive um, findings. So the initial study had 126 youth. 
At the 11 year follow up, which was the basis of this study, they still had 80 participants. And when they looked at how these individuals were doing 11 years later, they found that those who initially responded to CBIT, 67% of them still demonstrated at least partial remission of their tics. However, those who received supportive therapy instead, none of them demonstrated even partial remission. So again, a, a very significant difference in how effective CBIT is even 11 years later. So again, focusing on that fact that we're giving them tools and then they have these tools and they can use them um, to manage their lives more effectively. There are some treatment considerations in who we do this treatment with, or if we do it with certain populations, some things we need to consider to help them um, access it more effectively. So some of the, these considerations include age, client commitment, comorbidity, and clinician characteristics. So generally this intervention is intended for individuals nine and older. This isn't a hard and fast rule, but younger children often struggle to identify their premonitory urges. So remember the premonitory urges are the feelings in their body that tell them that they feel like they need to tick. And younger children um, have a lot of difficulty figuring out what those are. And when uh, individuals can't figure out what those are, it's hard to use the habit reversal. Additionally, this is a lot of work. So again, it's not a quick fix. It's an intervention that requires a lot of commitment and effort on the part of the client and for uh, children, clients, their parents as well. So younger children often don't have the capacity to commit to that kind of effort. The same kind of rule um, goes around for individuals with lower intellectual functioning. So you need to use caution in your clinical discretion if you're working with younger children uh, with CBIT or with people with intellectual disabilities. So again, this takes a lot of commitment. It's hard. It can be quite uncomfortable. So it's important that upfront the client and the parent know what's happening um, and that they're willing to invest in the homework because if they're not, this is gonna be a waste of their time. There are also some comorbidity considerations. So there are three um, disorders that kind of go together. So Tourette's, ADHD, and OCD. So this is sometimes called the Tourette's triad or Tourette's plus, because most individuals with Tourette's have at least one of those other disorders and a large chunk of individuals have both ADHD and OCD. And it's important to consider these other diagnoses because they can impact the effectiveness of CBIT. Um, so again, ADHD can negatively impact treatment if the symptoms aren't managed. So if the ADHD symptoms are pretty severe, it may be beneficial for them to get some treatment for their ADHD prior to beginning CBIT. When you are working with individuals who have ADHD, some things to consider that may make it more accessible for them is to have shorter, more frequent sessions. So instead of following the sessions the way they're laid out, make them much shorter and then just add a lot more sessions so that you're not taxing their um, attention and effort spans. Additionally, it can be helpful to have other separate parent sessions to give them more support in supporting their child who has ADHD and Tourette's. Uh, the other two are pretty common things that we do when we work with kids with ADHD. We try to minimize distractions and provide extra reinforcers to help them engage. In the area of OCD, it's really important to differentiate between tics and obsessions or compulsions. So they can often look somewhat similar but our treatment for them is very different. So it's important that we take the time to determine if this behavior that we're seeing is a tick or if it's a compulsion. So in compulsions, they tend to have very specific cognitions related to that behavior. They tend to think that something bad is going to happen if they don't engage in the behavior. Um, and that leads to some physiological arousal. Ticks are quite different in that they don't think that something bad is going to happen. They have this kind of feeling in their body that they need to do it, kind of like uh, that feeling where you need to sneeze, right? 
They don't have cognition that something bad is going to happen. They just feel like they have to do it. So it's really important to kind of dig into some of these differences, especially if you know that the individual is diagnosed with both OCD and tics, or if you suspect that they may also have OCD. Because again, the treatment for compulsions is quite different than the treatment for tics. So OCD requires exposure prevention therapy, and we want to make sure that we're not trying to use habit reversal on compulsions because that's not going to be effective. Some other comorbidity considerations, again, include developmental disabilities. So in individuals where you think they will be able to access CBIT, you often will have to be more direct, more rule-specific. Um, the issue with ADHD of maybe having shorter, more frequent sessions would also be helpful for this population. They tend to need more reinforcers and more concrete reinforcers to stay engaged. For people who have depression, generally, we want to uh, treat the depression before the CBIT. And for anxiety, um, if it's pr their primary diagnosis, then we would want to treat that before the CBIT. However, if it's more secondary to their Tourette's, then it tends to be more acceptable to continue with CBIT treatment. Finally, lots of kids with Tourette's have some anger issues. So about 20 to 30% of them have rage outbursts. So these are intense and sudden um, out, outbursts of anger with really significant remorse afterwards. So with these children, we want to also include typical supports for their anger because CBIT isn't going to address this part of their challenge. Some of the clinician qualifications include that you're familiar with the CBIT principles, you're familiar with what Tourette syndrome looks like, and you're familiar with their comorbidities. So making sure that you feel confident and competent to support um, using the CBIT practices. One thing to consider too is that generally speaking, clinicians who do more talk therapy tend to struggle more in implementing CBIT, where clinicians who do more assessment or behavioral interventions tend to uh, be a little bit more comfortable with this. And this is because lots of the parts of the intervention require talking, but the purpose of the talking isn't therapeutic. It's to give them a natural setting for the tics to emerge. And sometimes people who do a lot of talk therapy get kind of caught up in the talking and in a therapeutic manner, um, rather than using that time to really attend to the kids' tics. So again, those people who do assessment or more behavioral interventions are used to kind of talking with clients while watching for their behaviors. So again, if you do more talk therapy, that's something that you'll need to kind of be aware of and manage that this talking in these settings is not the same as talk therapy. Okay, next we're gonna dig into the treatment structure and the core components of CBIT. Again, the rationale for CBIT, overall structure, psychoeducation, how to create a tick hierarchy, how to create an inconvenience review, and uh, the behavioral reward program. So the very first session of CBIT, you go over all of these components. So we already talked about the rationale for CBIT, but again, during sessions, this would be covered in the very first session. Um, the core components include habit reversal therapy, and we'll go over this in more detail later, where we really focus on awareness about the tick. So having the client become aware of when they're ticking, then uh, increase their awareness of premonitory urges. So we want them to not only be aware of when they're ticking, but back up a bit and be aware of when they feel like they're about to tick. And then we want to teach them competing responses. The other core component is that functional based assessment intervention. Some additional elements that aren't core but are supportive to the process include psychoeducation, so understanding their tics and the physiology and the etiology of them. 
relaxation training. Um, and then near the end, you'll work on re relapse prevention. And another component then is the motivation, which includes rewards and inconvenience. And this is important, again, because of how much effort uh, CBIT takes. So we want to make sure that we are continuing to support their motivation to engage in it. Again, psychoeducation. So this is part of the thing that you go over with the parents and the client to make sure that they understand Tourette syndrome. So you go over, over the rationale for CBIT, how Tourette's is diagnosed, the phenomenology of it, the natural history of tics, the social difficulties and comorbidities related to Tourette's syndrome, the genetic and neurobiological basis of Tourette syndrome, and then the prevalence rates. So I don't have that information in here, um, but it's definitely information that you can find. And if you get the books, uh, all of that information is in the books as well. So one of the main things that we do at the beginning is create a tick hierarchy. And this is to help us pick which ticks we're gonna work on first in the competing responses and the functional behavior interventions. So first you start with listing all of the ticks that were identified during the assessment. You may need to ask about ticks that have come up during the intake. So maybe you've seen some things that look like ticks that they don't have on the list that maybe need to be added to them. Now you rate the severity of each of those ticks using SUDS. So with older kids, it can be the numbers one to 10. For younger kids or kids with delays, maybe you can use the faces instead, but we wanna know how much each of those ticks bothers them because some of the ticks that look the worst may not be the most problematic for them. Uh, so we really want to focus on the ones that are important to them rather than, than the ones that we think are the most important. So then you start to choose the order of the ticks to address. One way that we think about this is starting with the most severe, but we need to combine that with the one that's going to be the most successful. So again, this is hard work. So we want them to experience early success. So if the tick that they choose is likely to be really challenging to come up with a competing response for, you may help to guide them to choose another tick for their first one so that they can gain some success and feeling of competence in coming up with and using competing responses so that then when they use it with that severe one, they're more likely to be successful. You go over this every week. So at the beginning of every session, you review the tick hierarchy, you re-rate them all to see if they're getting better, um, the same or worse. And then you add to that list as necessary because as we know, ticks come and go. And so new ones can come throughout the therapy. We also do an inconvenience review, and this is part of the way that we help motivate our clients to continue to work um, on the CBIT process. So you have the patients list all the things they hate about the ticks, and then we use this as a motivator um, for that hard work, right? So we think about all the bad things and then about how controlling them will help make things better for these individuals. And then we also come up with a reward program right at the beginning of CBIT. Again, because of the hard work. So we want to, so even when kids are really motivated and they want to have control over their ticks, as they get into this, sometimes they don't want to do the work, right? Anybody who works with kids know that their motivation varies significantly. And especially when things aren't going the way that they want, um, that motivation can wane pretty quickly. So we include these behavioral rewards so that when things are really hard, they have an external motivator as well. Um, and in this, we're rewarding effort, not success. So are they doing their homework? Are they trying to use their competing responses? So even if they're not working, that's fine. What we want is that they're working hard on it, not that they're necessarily getting success from it. So in these behavioral reward programs, we come up with points for things like attending, participating in sessions, completing homework, all of those things. Um, and again, this is a little bit of an external reward and that inconvenience uh, list is our more internal reward. So we don't only use the external, but sometimes it's helpful 
um, when things get challenging for students to have that external reward as well. And so then what the reward is, is something that's come up with in conjunction with the parent and the child. Um, it doesn't have to be something that costs money. It could be a special movie night or doing some fun thing that they want to do. Um, so oftentimes there are multiple things that they can pick depending on the points, but it's important that it doesn't necessarily have to be things that cost money. All right, so then we get into the functional behavior assessment and intervention. So some of the steps of this, as we do a functional assessment, so we kind of figure out what in the environment is increasing the likelihood of these ticks. We develop some interventions to manage those, um, and then we develop a plan for implementing those interventions. So in the functional behavior assessment component, we try to determine the factors that make the ticks worse. So this could be people, a sibling or a specific teacher. It could be places. So maybe it's when they go to the dojo for their uh, martial arts practice. It could be specific demands. So whenever they're asked to do math homework, that makes it worse. Or it could be specific situations. So you kind of try to find out this information through a thorough interview with the parent and child. So in this functional behavior assessment, we really look at the connection between antecedents, behavior, and consequences. So we know that we really can't control the ticks on their own. So we focus on the things that we can control. So we can control the antecedents and we can control the consequences. So again, the antecedents are those places and situation, people, activities, and internal experiences. And our consequences are reinforcement, positive reinforcement, which is what we normally think of with reinforcement, which are rewards, negative reinforcement, uh, which if you remember from your intro psych classes is escape, right? So an example would be you have to Clean, stay in your room until it's clean, right? And so then the reward or the reinforcement is you get to leave after you clean your room. And then punishment, again, uh, in behaviorism is really anything that reduces the likelihood of the behavior happening in the future. So Billy's story is in the therapist's book. And so I just took it to use for... Um, this presentation to give you a sense about how we can apply this practice of understanding antecedents, behavior, and consequences to develop an intervention. All right, so we're gonna imagine Billy. Billy has Tourette syndrome. He often comes home from school stressed out and anxious, and he just wants to go watch TV. And his sister's usually there. So he goes in the TV room, he sits in there, and he starts to tick loudly. And so, of course, his sister is annoyed. And because she's annoyed with him and he's interfering with her watching TV, she starts teasing him about his tics. Mom hears all of this, comes in, sends sister out, comforts Billy, and tells him that he can watch whatever he wants until dinner. So since this has been happening, Billy ticks a lot every time he comes home from school, especially if he's watching TV uh, with his sister. So from this story, we can fill out the ABC chart here. So we can see some of our antecedents for him is he's already stressed out. So he comes home from school stressed out. That's an antecedent. He's also anxious. One of the other antecedents is the timing, right? So it's after school. And then some of the other situational antecedents are that he's with his sister and he's watching television. Some of the reinforcements then, the positive ones, are that his sister teases him, his mom comforts him, and then he gets to watch whatever he wants until dinner. He also has some negative reinforcements in that his sister is sent away. So this uncomfortable experience gets removed. And in this situation, there was nothing that was punishing, meaning there's nothing that happened that reduced the likelihood of his tics. So these things increase Billy's ticks, but this is important to note 
that Billy isn't manipulating this situation in order to, again, get that comfort from his mom or to watch TV. He probably doesn't even realize that he's ticking more because of these. Um, and his mom doesn't realize that she's reinforcing him through this, but it actually is what is happening. So we need to address these antecedents and consequences to reduce his ticks when he comes home from school. So again, examples of antecedents that can affect ticks include our emotional uh, states, upset, anxiety, and as we mentioned earlier, even positive things like excitement, activities, and they can be quite varied and uh, depending on the person. So being alone, being in groups, watching television, talking about ticks, stressful events, any of these things can uh, increase the likelihood of ticks. Examples of consequences that can affect ticks, again, things that can increase adult reactions, including comfort and attention, escape, getting to leave the classroom, getting out of a specific task at home or at school, peer attention, and this can be positive or negative. Either of those can increase ticks. Things that can decrease, um, if we help to avoid teasing and embarrassment, that can help to alleviate some of that. Um, and also increased positive participation can help to decrease ticks. And it's important also to note that ticks themselves are a negative reinforcement. So again, that premonitory urge or that itchy kind of feeling that people get that says, I need to tick. After they tick, they get relief, right? So that's a negative reinforcement, that premonitory urge that icky, itchy feeling goes away. So when these individuals engage in ticks, they're getting relief through that negative reinforcement. So we want to kind of put a barrier between associating ticking with that relief. So when we get to the point where we learn uh, the competing responses, practicing those competing responses helps individuals habituate to the premonitory urge. So similar to like if you have an itch, if you can hold out and not scratch that itch long enough, it's probably going to go away. So the competing responses or things that they do instead of ticking, um, that they can kind of control themselves until the urge goes away. So this disrupts that neurological motor pattern that's established through the ticks and also removes that negative reinforcement of the relief that they get from engaging in the ticks. When we think about those functional behavioral interventions that we can do, again, we're trying to control the environment to help reduce the ticks or reduce the impact of the ticks. So the things that we need to focus on are removing reinforcing consequences. So what are the things that we're increasing the ticks and can we get rid of them altogether or reduce them? We also wanna minimize or avoid the antecedents or the things that exacerbate or increase the chance of risk of ticks in the first place. Uh, sometimes these situations are not avoidable. So we wanna make sure that when kids have to engage in the situations that are likely to increase their ticks, that we see if we can have some scheduled breaks in them. And these are really great times for them to practice their habit reversal as well. It's also really important to educate teachers and others about ticks so they can understand how maybe they are inadvertently uh, increasing ticks when they think that they're doing something helpful. So if we think again back to Billy and some of the antecedents that he had, one was anxiety. So one of the things that we can do to support him with managing his anxiety so it's less likely to increase his tics is to teach him relaxation strategies, which again is part of the CBIT process. Um, another one was that it was watching TV after school in the den with his sister. So we can change any of those components. Like we can say, you're not with your sister. We can say, hey, maybe you shouldn't watch TV when you get home from school, or maybe you shouldn't go in the den. So changing any one of those has the potential to change that antecedent. <laughs> then the things that are reinforcers, so increase the likelihood of ticks, 
his sister teases. So coming up with an intervention to reduce his sister's teasing him. We also need to get his mom to stop comforting him at this time. So it's really important that parental comfort is incredibly important, but when it occurs right after ticks, it's reinforcing the ticks. So we need to help mom to kind of be non-emotive and not comforting at this time, save up that comfort and give it to him another time because that, that still is really important, but doing it right after ticks is inadvertently reinforcing them. Also, again, Billy isn't necessarily doing this on purpose, but as a result of this, he gets what he wants, right? His sister gets in trouble, she gets sent out of the room, and he gets to watch whatever he wants to dinner. So changing that consequence is also important. And then again, his sister is sent away, that negative reinforcer. So one thing that we could change is instead of sending her away, make her apologize and stay and have some interventions again to help her not tease. Some example interventions for other uh, types of antecedents include having a bedtime routine and relaxation practice if bedtime is a trigger for ticks. Car rides can be a trigger for ticks. So we want to make sure that we, um, again, we need to reduce safety risks. So have the child locks on, have the child in the middle seat if they can. Um, schedule car rides during times that are low risk for ticks when that's possible. And then again, this is a really great time to practice the competing response. Classroom have preferred seating, which doesn't necessarily mean in the front of the room. So maybe it's in the back of the room or in a corner, some place where it's less likely to exacerbate ticks. After school, it tends to be a big time for ticks. So having some downtime can be really beneficial where you're not watching TV or doing homework or having demands, um, but you just have some relaxation time. And watching television can also be an antecedent for ticks. And so one thing that we can do with that is limit TV watching. Some example consequences beyond Billy's story, uh, social attention. So some of the things that people do sometimes is they tell the kid not to tick. That's not helpful. So refraining from those uh, can change his, the tick likelihood. Again, not comforting the child during ticks, not laughing at them, uh, and encouraging peers not to react to the child's ticking. So teach them to just ignore it, and that can help them to reduce the likelihood of increasing ticks. We also don't want to give them that negative reinforcement of escape. So if a kid always ticks in math class and then gets to leave math class and go do something else, that's not great. So um, have them do their math somewhere else. So they can't get out of the uncomfortable task. They need to still be able to work through that task if we don't want to have a negative reinforcement for their ticks. Again, reminding them to use their competing response or the one at bedtime often is a time for ticks for kids that they have to stay in their room at bedtime because again, they didn't want to go to bed. Being able to leave their room is negatively reinforcing for them. And then working on developing the plan for implementation. So you discuss the plan with the parents about when and how the intervention will be implemented. So it's important that you come up with a plan that the parents feel like they can actually do. So you can come up with the best plan in the world. And if parents are like, yeah, we're not going to be able to implement it, then that's not the right plan. So you need to combine having something that's going to effectively address antecedents and consequences, but something that the parents can implement. So one of the things that is helpful is to preventively talk about the challenges that they might uh, face as they're trying to implement this plan. So you can make plans ahead of time, again, to increase the likelihood that they'll be successful. And then sometimes parents need some training or support in order to know how to implement the plan. So it's important that the therapist helps to identify those during that challenge phase, and then provide parents with the supports that they need to implement the plan. 
So a, a complementary part of the CBIT program is relaxation technique. So this is not part of the competing response, um, but it is used to manage anxiety and physiological responses. So these include diaphragmatic breathing and progressive muscle relaxation. We'll talk about more of this in session two, um, but also I know that many therapists and people who work with kids do have experience with both of those. And then the other core component of CBIT is habit reversal training. So the very first part of habit reversal training is being aware. So sometimes kids don't even realize it when they're ticking. So this part is helping them to become aware of when they're ticking because we can't change our behavior until we're aware of it. So we start to have some self-monitoring. They have response description. So they start to describe what the tick is um, to help with early response detection and then early warning, which is the premonitory urge. So the self-monitoring part, again, this is necessary, but not sufficient. So again, it's about increasing their awareness of what's going on because we can't change what we're not aware of. So we want them to pay attention to when they tick, how much they're ticking, um, like th throughout the day. So you would have them have very specific times throughout the day where they kind of just sit and watch and or their parents sit and watch and tally them. And they also were asking them to have a higher awareness of it throughout the day so that they can talk to you about it the next time so that we can increase our understanding about their ticking behaviors. Then we move into response detection. So on this one, we want the patient to define whatever tick we're working on in really great detail. We want them to describe every single body part involved, even some that seem very far away from their tick. We want them to think about the order of the movements, where it starts, where it ends. Um, we want them to think about their sensations and those tick signals or premonitory urges. And the really important part of this, again, is about paying attention to it. So this description in and of itself isn't important, but being aware of what's happening in their body so that they're more likely to be able to know when to use that competing response is what's important. So in response detection and early warning, this is a task that helps them to become more aware of when they're ticking. Um, again, because we can't use the competing response effectively if we don't know when ticks are happening. So in response detection, sometimes the therapist will have to uh, simulate the tick if uh, the child is having trouble coming up with the description. And then the therapist can talk about, well, these are some things that I'm feeling. Is that what you're feeling so that they can start to get a sense about what's happening in their bodies. Then you have a conversation with them. And while this conversation is going on, you have them lift up their forefinger to say, yeah, I know I ticked right then. Again, having that more awareness about when ticks are happening. And so then throughout this, you practice with both praise and correction. So if you're chatting again about maybe what they did at baseball practice um, and you see them tick and they didn't raise their finger, you would interrupt them and you would talk about it. If they effectively did raise their hand when they ticked, then you would give them praise for that. And so again, the purpose of this is to help them to become more accurate and identifying when they're ticking. And then you move to early warning. So we want patients to identify when they have the urge to tick. And so maybe sometimes after they have the urge, they don't actually tick and sometimes they do, but we want them to be able to understand before they're ticking that it's about to happen. So after they've gotten to the point where they first are aware of the tick, then they can identify when they're ticking and then they can identify effectively before they tick then we look at working, uh, choosing a competing response. Um, and this can be a little bit challenging. Uh, we need to make sure that it's incompatible with the tick or at the minimum makes the tick harder to do. We need to make this competing response less noticeable and less interfering than the tick. So sometimes kids pick competing responses that are actually worse than the tick. So we don't want that. We want to make sure that it's something that's unobtrusive and um, not going to be as noticeable as the tick. 
And then the last one that can be really challenging is that you have to have a competing response that you can do anywhere. So like even in the shower. So sitting on your hands, you can't do that. Putting your hands in your pocket, you can't do that. So you have to really be creative and thinking about how they can do it anywhere, because if there are those limitations, then there are times they can't use their competing response. And we want to make sure that their competing response is always accessible to them. Then we have our social support coach, and their role, again, is to reinforce and prompt the use of competing responses, and then to praise them when they actually use their competing responses. So in this, we identify that support person. For kids, it's usually their mom. Uh, for adults, it can be a spouse, housemate, a sibling. And we really need to help these people to not be punitive. So oftentimes parents are used to being in the roles of disciplining their children, but their role in, in the social support is not that. Um, so sometimes we have to say, okay, you get one reminder per setting. So one during dinner and one during homework. Um, so for example, they can say, don't forget your exercise. And then they need to leave it go for the rest of dinner. We have to remember too, that for these kids, it's their treatment. And so I think oftentimes for parents that can be hard because we want to help our kids and we want to sometimes take control of things in order to help them. Uh, but we really need to help our kids to take control of their own treatment here. And again, the praise is about practice, not success. So sometimes it's hard and sometimes, you know, we had to come up with a couple of different competing responses before we find the one that works. So we really aren't predicating our praise on being successful with the competing response, but actually working on it. And then that reward program. So again, as I've said lots of times today, CBIT is hard work. And so those external motivations can help to keep them moving when things get hard. So again, they get uh, points for their effort. So things like doing their homework, coming to sessions, working hard during sessions, and the child and parent work together to determine what they can turn their points in for. Again, remembering that these can be non-monetary, um, staying up later, picking out the family movie, any of those things, and you review them during the sessions every week. All right, next week we will talk about, well, not next week, in the next session, I'll talk about the overview of actually implementing the plan. And I think I've left an appropriate amount of time that Julian asked for questions. Yes, thank you. Dr. Wilcox, uh, while we're just waiting for the questions to be posed in chat, I'll just um, launch the uh, post evaluation. Okay, so Sarah had asked about an example of a competing response that's been helpful. So one of the nice things, again, in that therapist book is they give a lot of examples um, about the kinds of things that you can use for uh, a competing response. So let me think about one. Uh, so for, for ones about like your nose twitching, right? So one would be like maybe just lifting your eyebrows up a little bit and your chin down, right? Because you can't scrunch up your nose if you're kind of stretching out those muscles. So that would be an example of uh, some ways that you could maybe use a competing response for a nose twitch one. Uh, so some some other ones would be like maybe you have an arm jerk, right? So one of the things that you can do is Hold your, have your arm down straight and slightly tense your muscles. So we don't want them to like super tense their muscles where they're going to like get uh, sore from doing that, but a slight tensing of their muscles, because if you're tensing your muscles while their arms are straight, you can't do uh, an arm swing. So those would be some examples about the kinds of things that we would use for competing responses. Uh, I don't know about links between ASD and tics. So, um, yeah, so I'm not exactly sure how that would work with the sensory processing. So I, I, I 
think generally with people with ASD, the sensory processing is things feel uncomfortable and they try to avoid them where ticks are, I need to do something with my body. Um, that's my general understanding, but I'm not an ASD expert. All right, so an example of a competing response for a vocal tick. Um, so it would depend what it is, but let's say that it is in like an echolalia one where they're saying words, right? So holding your mouth loosely open would be a way then that you aren't able to say words if you're having your mouth open. Yeah, and I'll give more detailed responses on competing responses in session two. Yeah, I think it's really hard if the child doesn't feel like the ticks are a problem for them, but their parents do. That can be really tough because uh, CBIT really requires that it has to be something that the kid wants to work on. And if the kid's like, I'm completely fine with these ticks, then CBIT's not going to work for them. Uh, they could try medication, but my guess is that the kid might also not want to take medication. So I think it's a balance between uh, accepting kids where they are, um, but I know that it can be really hard for parents, especially if the ticks look painful or are causing them to really stand out at school, which can cause social problems. So no easy answers uh, for kids who, who are okay with their ticks. Yeah, so CBA is for ticks in general, not just for... Um, not just for Tourette. So this would be an effective treatment for gen more general tick disorders as well. <laughs> 